Well, let me start by uh, thanking the president very much for the wonderful introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, and I also want to, of course, uh, thank Professor Michael Loy uh, for inviting me to present one of these lectures in this special series. Uh, it's a, a, a really a, a true honor uh, to help celebrate the 25 years of exciting things that have been going on uh, at HKUST uh, for 25 years. And uh, so I'm very pleased to be able to do this. <clears throat> now, what I'm going to talk about is this uh, idea of super resolution. But it's going to tell you a little bit more about that, is, is my real goal today, to tell you about the background and the history. And I'm very pleased to see a lot of students here, because I want to make sure that this is understandable to everyone. It's, going to, it's a talk for a somewhat general audience, but also some, a few things for the experts. So to give you a clear idea of what's going to happen, uh, <clears throat> the story that I'll describe is a, a story about physical chemistry, but also ultra-sensitive detection <clears throat> and industrial basic research, it turns out, uh, that had unexpected consequences down the road. Uh, the original work seemed very esoteric in some senses, but that turned out to be the key elements to achieve this idea called super resolution that spans on many areas of science, uh, many fields. So to tell the story, I'm going to begin with the early days of single molecule spectroscopy because single molecules are essential to what I'm going to describe, and then talk about how that relates to super resolution. Uh, then we'll go a little bit deeper to see how you can extract more information from single molecules if you're careful and you think about how the molecules actually work and how they interact with light. And finally, uh, end up with there's a little bit of time to talk about molecules in solution. Uh, not super resolution, but just watching individuals in solution. So let's begin with this uh, early days of single molecules. Now, <clears throat> in the mid-1980s, think back, you know, almost uh, 30 years or so, in the mid-1980s, a lot of things were going on that were very exciting in science. Uh, that was the first detection of an ion, okay, a single ion in a vacuum, and spectroscopy of an ion, uh, single atoms on surfaces by scanning tunneling microscopy. And so the, the question was in the air, can you detect single molecules? But there was a problem about single molecules. In fact, this very famous physicist, uh, Aaron Schrodinger, one of the founders of quantum mechanics, said in 1952, he said that we never experiment with just one electron or atom or small molecule. In uh, thought experiments, maybe we think we might, but it's all ridiculous and so on. <laughs> and you know, the funny thing about uh, such a statement from, from a Nobel laureate and a, and a great scientist, uh, as soon as somebody says it cannot be done, this is one of the great uh, you know, <laughs> encouragements for people to um, prove that he's wrong. Uh, there have been experiments with single electrons and atoms, and I'm going to talk about the single molecule part. But of course, in the mid-1980s, it, it was still thought to be impossible. So the first part of my story relates to describing how we thought, or how we came to believe that it is possible. Okay? And that goes back to some fundamentals. You have to learn about a few fundamentals. Let's think about molecules and solids. All right. Uh, and if you take a molecule like this one, which has a, a lot of conjugation, uh, many double bonds and single bonds, uh, this kind of a molecule will absorb light in the visible, okay? It has a color. If you put it in a transparent host that doesn't have much color, you can measure its optical absorption spectrum. So that's what this is. This is a room temperature absorption spectrum. And you see that this, this is the first electronic transition of this molecule. Uh, so in, uh, you know, in, the, in the sort of yellow-orange range of the spectrum. Now think about low temperatures. Let's take that same sample and cool it to very low temperatures. What's going to happen? You remove all vibrations in the solid, and all vibrations in, in, in the molecule cannot rotate. So everything gets much narrower. These absorption lines get very narrow. At low temperatures, here's the, uh, a low temperature absorption spectrum. Now I'm, I've changed the direction, OK? But it, that doesn't matter. Uh, you can trans translate between wavelength and frequency. This transition becomes this transition, and there's actually four copies because there are four inequivalent sites in the, in the host crystal, okay? So the, the, the main transition has become extremely narrow. But it turns out, even though this looks narrow and it's a very small range of color space, there's a lot more information inside this, this electronic transition, this absorption band right here. In fact, people knew at that time that that kind of absorption line is very much like this, really. It's what's called an inhomogeneously broadened absorption line. It's, com it's composed of many narrow absorptions, 
but there is a distribution of center frequencies. That is, the different local environments in the solid have slightly different strains and stresses. And so because the molecules are so narrow, the absorption is so narrow, you, you push the molecules to slightly different frequencies. That makes this inhomogeneously broad in line. I was at IBM Research at this time. And at IBM Research, we were trying to do something useful with these inhomogeneously broad in lines. Okay? What were we trying to do? Well, we were trying to store data in this inhomogeneously broad in line using a technique called spectral hole burning. Let me explain how this works. If you have an inhomogeneously broad in line, uh, basically coming from a molecule in a solid at low temperatures, then you can imagine a single frequency laser, if you just irradiate it with a very narrow band single frequency laser, only a small subset of the molecules will be excited. Okay? And then if you have some photochemistry or some change in the local environment, that absorption moves away. In general, it moves to some other frequency, leaving behind a dip, a dip, or a reduction in absorption, which we call the spectral hole. All right? So that's what a spectral hole is. And at IBM, we were using this idea, this process, to think about storing data in the frequency domain, frequency domain optical storage. You can tune the laser to the different colors, and you can write or not write uh, holes, which means you can encode 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, so forth. In other words, writing data in the frequency domain, all in the same spot, just by tuning the laser. So this is an, an idea, okay? one of those ideas that comes out of a great place like the IBM Research Labs. In fact, uh, it's an example of these uh, wonderful research centers that were available at the time. Bell Laboratories is another example, and so on, where people could explore an, a special idea, a new revolutionary idea, and not only do the, the uh, engineering of the idea, but also ask scientific questions, deep scientific questions about this. The question that I was asking is, is this inhomogeneously broad in line, shown here or here, is it smooth? Is it perfectly smooth when you have billions of molecules contributing to the inhomogeneous line? Is it smooth? Okay? And, and you can see why we asked that. Because if there were some roughness on this line, then that would produce a, a, a noise, or if you like, or a background signal that would make it potentially hard to detect these spectral holes. Okay? So we set out to measure to see if this is really smooth. And uh, my postdoc, Tom Carter, and I, in 1987, uh, measured a piece of this inhomogeneously brought in line. Now think of it being spread out. So we're going to look at a very small piece, OK, which would be horizontal. It would be just a horizontal line if there was no structure. And what we saw was this, an amazing structure. And it, it, we called it statistical fine structure. And if you measure it once, here's a small piece of it. If you measure it once and then measure it again, you get exactly the same structure. So it's not time-dependent noise. It is a spectral roughness, OK? And the thing that's cool about this, even though it seems quite you know, esoteric, is that it's coming from the numbers of molecules that are in resonance and a statistical effect. That is, as you go from one frequency to another, even though the average number of molecules is the same, each slice of frequency space is another measurement, is another experiment. So due to probability, probability and statistics, there will be number fluctuations in the actual number of molecules at each frequency. And that's why this effect, that's why this absorption changes. The amplitude of this signal scales as the, as the square root of the number of molecules in resonance. The square root. Think of that. There's sort of, you, you, I hope that someone will tell me someday if there's any other spectral feature that scales as the square root of the number of molecules. Usually if you put 10 times more molecules in, you see 10 times more signal. And that's what happens with the average signal. But this, uh, the, the RMS amplitude of this deviation from the average signal scales as the square root of n. Now, that's very important for single molecule detection. At this point, you know, we weren't trying to detect single molecules. But when I realized that this signal scales as the square root of n, then it turns out that to get to the single molecule limit, you only have to work the square root of n times harder. You don't have to work n times harder. Think about that for a minute. If this is coming from 1,000 molecules, then its amplitude is the square root of 1,000, about 30. So you only have to work 30 times harder to see one molecule, OK? Not 1,000 times harder. This was done by uh, something called laser FM spectroscopy. So because of that scaling, we decided, let's push it further. Let's dilute. Let's reduce the number of molecules. Can we see a single molecule by this? And indeed, we were able to do that. In 1989, this is Lothar Cotter now. 
Uh, the, uh, the signature of a single molecule looks like a little W in, in frequency space because of uh, another modulation that we did for technical reasons. And you can see that W shape right here for now pinacine in paratrophenyl. Um, <clears throat> very similar to terylene. Now these, these sort of large aromatic hydrocarbons uh, behave quite similarly. So uh, <clears throat> the point is we used an optical method that measures the transmitted light and tells you when you're, the molecule is absorbing. All right? So um, that was an important first step because it showed that you could optically detect a single molecule's absorption. Uh, and a, a year later, uh, a, another important experiment occurred uh, when uh, uh, Michel Aurie in France took the same sample, penicene and paratrophenyl, and also detected the absorption. But he, uh, he, uh, the measurement was done by recording the emitted fluorescence from the molecule. Right. See, in the first experiment, we were measuring the transmitted light in that FM spectroscopy. Now this is measuring the emitted light. But both experiments are clearly absorption experiments because the molecule has to absorb light to give you a signal. Um, <clears throat> it turns out this method gives you a little bit better signal to noise. So most people switch to this method after that important experiment from, from uh, uh, Michel Aurie. So now, imagine what happened. The first single molecule experiments. No one had really done experiments in this regime before. We were removing ensemble averaging. We did not have to average over millions or billions of molecules. You could measure one at a time. And that turns out to be a new regime. When you break into a new regime, usually surprises start occurring, right? And if there weren't surprises, then we wouldn't be here today talking. So here's some of the cool surprises that occurred. Uh, I'm now just scanning the laser again and again and again over the same piece of frequency space. There you can see a single molecule. And uh, the amazing thing here is that the molecule is jumping from one frequency to another. It's moving around in frequency space. Now that was a surprise when, when Pat Ambrose saw this in my lab, across the hall he came running over and he said, the molecules are jumping around. And we were going, really? I mean, this is low temperature, 1.4 degrees Kelvin in a crystal. Why should there be these dynamics, OK? Uh, well, it turned out that was because the nearby host did have some low frequency excitations, and some of our theoretical friends helped us understand this. This basically was something called spectral diffusion that had been postulated many years before, that molecules could move around in frequency space at low temperatures, especially in polymers, but also even here in these crystals. Uh, <clears throat> now imagine if I take the laser and hold it at one frequency, just hold it at one uh, frequency without scanning, then I'll see the molecule uh, jump into and out of resonance. I'll see the light blinking on and off, on, off, on, off. When the molecule's in resonance, you see light. If, if the molecule's out of resonance, you don't see light. So this blinking effect, uh, you'll see it come back later in a, in a few minutes. Also, by the way, notice this crazy uh, old data. This is a, a, was, a, was a fancy oscilloscope at that time, a data 6,000. Look at that signal, right? And how did we record the data? Well, you take your camcorder and you hold it up in front. This is the camcorder taking a picture of the oscilloscope screen. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of different than what you think about today. But it, you know, it worked great to, dis to, to uh, you know, discover something amazing. Now, another thing that happened at that time is that uh, we found that you could, you could switch the molecules. Uh, switching to uh, perylene and polyethylene, here is a single molecule of perylene. We scan over it. Nothing's much is going on in this case. Then bring the laser into resonance, and the, the emission stays large for a while and then jumps down to the background. If you scan, you don't see any molecule. That means the molecule was driven away. It was driven somewhere else in frequency space outside of this window. It's the equivalent of hole burning, spectral hole burning, but now for one molecule. Okay, I made it move away. And uh, so, okay, well, Tomas saw that, and then he said, well, this is great. And then, you know, he waited a little while and scanned again, and the molecule was back. It's back to the same frequency. You could scan it more times, then drive it away and make it disappear. So we could measure the kinetics. We, we could measure the time dependence of how long it took before the molecule would, would go away or burn, in this case, if in terms of spectral hole burning. Uh, and you, you could see Poisson's the kinetics uh, that you would expect from a, from a single molecule's uh, uh, simple first order rate equation, okay, for, for the process. So, you know, the, my point here is that we observe this blinking and this switching business even at low temperatures. So, <clears throat> in parallel with all this low temperature work, which was a beautiful, fruitful area for basic science, then in addition, various people decided let's push this idea to room temperature. 
And uh, uh, you could detect single molecules at room temperature as well. And I list a bunch of the uh, uh, pioneers of this uh, along the top here. Because a number of people showed that by many different methods, you could also detect single molecules at room temperature if you were very careful about the experiment. Uh, Dick Keller is like the first person on the list here. Unfortunately, Dick died about a year ago, uh, but I want to mention and recognize his important pioneering contributions. What are we doing at room temperature now? Uh, at room temperature, remember, there's an, the absorption line is broad. It's not extremely narrow. Uh, but we're still pumping a molecule from a ground state to an electronic excited state, then some vibrational relaxation, emission of light. So here's the emitted light, and you want to cycle the molecule this way to get more photons. Uh, we tend to avoid dark states, but later I'll show you we can use dark states, like, like triplet states. So the idea at room temperature is that we focus the laser down to the smallest spot possible, roughly, but, but that can't be infinitely small. There is this process called diffu uh, diffraction, okay, uh, that depends upon the wavelength of light. Uh, the, this rule, wavelength divided by two times the, the numerical aperture of the microscope, controls how small this spot can be. Uh, it's here uh, for visible light, let's say about 250 nanometers. So that's, that's the, the pumping light. And now remember the molecules we're looking at are similar to these that I'm showing you here, uh, fluorescent dyes of various sorts or fluorescent proteins. And usually we use those as labels on the molecule of interest, whether it be a protein or a DNA. To get to the single molecule limit then, since the absorption is broad, not narrow anymore, we can't use the color of the laser to select the molecule very much. We, we have to dilute the molecules to make them be farther apart in order to get to the single molecule limit, farther apart than this focal spot that I just told you about. So that is the way we do single molecule experiments at room temperature. You, you collect this emitted light, but make sure that only one molecule is pumped. So let's see some examples of room temperature right quick. Detection of single molecules at room temperature, and here's an example from biology from uh, a particular protein called the MHC2 protein. There's the full name of it. This is a protein involved in, in your immune system. It's present on almost all cells in your body. And here's the structure of the protein. Uh, it turns out that it will bind a small peptide, uh, which is an antigen, okay? It's something that uh, may have been invading your body or it's one of your own uh, pieces of a protein, a, a peptide. The way we do these experiments is to take an antigen and label it with a fluorophore and so that this antigen will bind to the MHC2, all right? And so that's the protein. It's in the membrane of the cell. And uh, so here is an image of the cell, the, the light coming from the, the sample, of course, uh, from the method I just showed you. And you see that these little spots are the single molecules. Notice they're not infinitely small. They're, they have a size. And that size is coming from this diffraction limit that I just described, of about 250 nanometers or so in diameter. Well, <clears throat> um, if this were all there was, just a picture with some spots, then we wouldn't be so interested. But look what happens at room temperature as you watch this, uh, this cell as a function of time. You see the molecules doing this fantastic dance on the surface of the cell. They're moving all over the place. This is thermally driven diffusion. This is standard and work, works on our cells all the time. Uh, in fact, it's faster on our cells because we're at 37 degrees C. This was done at about 22. Uh, you see them moving all around. And you also see something else you see that uh, they emit for some time, and then they turn off. They stop emitting. That's the process that we call photobleaching. It's very much like your, your blue genes, which are no longer blue, but they're mostly white because you've bleached the, the molecules that are making it blue. This is uh, the uh, fact that a single molecule will emit maybe a million photons, and then it will have some sort of a change that will cause it to no longer be an emitter. So uh, all these effects turn out to be useful in various ways, but they were thought to be problems in the early experiments. Anyway, I still love that old movie, right, of the molecules dancing on the surface of the cell. And being able to watch molecules move as a function of time is still exciting, as we'll talk about in a little bit. Well, something else happened in the mid-90s, um, now 1997. Uh, this is an important experiment because uh, my postdoc, Rob Dixon, and I decided, can we detect a single copy of a green fluorescent protein? In this case, a derivative of green fluorescent protein that emits in the yellow, yellow fluorescent protein, enhanced yellow fluorescent protein. At that time, I was at UC San Diego, University of California, San Diego, and, and that's where Roger Chin uh, worked. 
and uh, works. And uh, Roger, uh, Roger's postdoc, Andy Cubitt, uh, gave us uh, some of this protein, uh, EYFP. So we, we first set out to see, can we have detect single copies of fluorescent proteins? And here's an example of an image of single YFPs. So indeed, we could detect them. Um, <clears throat> that was a great start. But of course, once again, it's, it's a different regime that people had not explored before. Single copies of fluorescent proteins at room temperature. We saw surprises right off the bat. The first surprise is that these molecules will blink. That is, they emit for a while, on, 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 multiple frames, and then off, and on again, off again, in a, in a random sort of pattern. Uh, very much like that blinking I showed you at low temperatures, but now it's going on at room temperature. It turns out that what we're doing in this system is pumping and collecting the emission from the emissive form of GFP, but it turns out there are also some dark states accessible to the molecule that represent isomerizations of, uh, of the GFP chromophore or other dynamics that make it turn off for some time, but it can also come back a tunnel over this barrier of room temperature uh, or thermally uh, uh, surmount the barrier so that they could, it could begin to emit again. Okay? So there's there's some interesting dynamics in YFP that wasn't quite expected. In addition, we could also switch the molecule. That is, we could pump it for a long time, and it'll, it will go into a long-lived dark state, appear to be photobleached, but a little bit of blue light would turn it back on again. Uh, and then you could use it up so it's dark, and a little bit of blue light comes back on again. So uh, we could also switch the molecules. So uh, again, an interesting idea. Uh, and, you, <clears throat> and you might see that uh, at the top of this page, well. Let me just say that once we observed that you could see switching in, in fluorescent proteins, a bunch of experts started making better switchable fluorescent proteins. Um, PAGFP is one example, DRONPA, another example, and there's many more. Well, why is there a patent listed up here at the top? Uh, well, the reason is, uh, remember I came from IBM, and I had gone to UC San Diego, and so Roger Chen and I felt that, well, maybe we could use this for something. How about optical storage? Remember, I came from IBM. Uh, maybe you could store single copies uh, of single molecules for one bit uh, using these sorts of ideas. Okay, so even though that idea didn't, didn't become practical, uh, it turns out you know it was it was something we thought was useful at the time. Now, before I go on, I've, I've given you all of the fundamentals for super resolution microscopy, actually. But before I describe the Nobel Prize itself, let me now give a, a moment, okay, for us to have a, a little bit of fun with all of this. And let, so let me ask you this question. What is the next best thing to being picked for a Nobel Prize? Okay, so you think about that for a moment. What's the next best thing? <laughs> uh, of course, different people will have a different answer for this question. But I'm going to give you my answer. And my answer is being picked by Milhouse on The Simpsons. <laughs> well, some people laugh because they may know what The Simpsons are. Uh, maybe others don't, and so I apologize, but I'll tell you all about it. Turns out that The Simpsons is a, is a comedy show on TV in the United States. Uh, how many have heard of, or seen or watched the, the Simpsons? Anybody? Yeah, oh, there's a lot. Okay, so that's great. <clears throat> so it turns out in 2010, 2010 uh, episode one of season 22, here's what happened. Uh, the family is waking up in the middle of the night, and they go, oh my gosh, why do we have to get up so early? Why do we have to get up at 3 and 4 in the morning? And, and uh, Homer Simpson, the father, says, because we got to watch the Nobel Prize announcements. <laughs> and so they come out and they sit on the couch in front of the TV, and it turns out they have a betting pool, believe it or not. And they show on the screen, here's the betting pool. Here's the different family members, Martin, Milhouse, etc. Here's the different prizes. And look on this list right there. <laughs> <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> and there's, uh, there are several other uh, great scientists on this list. Here's, here's Ben Faringa, Dick Zare, and Steve Harris. And uh, underneath this is Lena Howe. So, you know, those, those Simpsons people were, uh, had studied up on a few things. But anyway, you can see why I say this is the next best thing to getting the Nobel Prize. It's being on the Simpsons, right? <clears throat> Of course, the real prize itself is, is even better. <laughs> and I'm, I'm greatly honored to share the prize with Eric Betzig and Stefan Hell. Um, Stefan, as you heard earlier, uh, is involved with the Stimulated Emission Depletion Microscope. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about that, although we have one that, that we've built in my lab 
uh, even right now. I'm going to talk about um, the connection that is close, closer with Eric Betzig because it depends upon single molecules. So um, <clears throat> to give you a flavor for what we're talking about when we say super resolution, let me try to set it up in this sort of a way. Here, here is a bacterial cell. Bacteria are small. They're only a couple of microns in length and maybe 500 nanometers across. And inside the bacteria, specific, one specific protein has been fused with fluorescent protein so that you're looking at the light okay, from those labels, uh, those fluorescent protein labels. And you might say, I want to see the structure. I want to see what structure those molecules are making. You might think that all you have to do is to buy the most expensive microscope you can. Here it is. Here's that most expensive microscope. But you don't see any structure. <clears throat> this, of course, is a conventional microscope. Uh, and why don't you see any structure? Even though the labels themselves are very small, just a few nanometers in size, one fluorescent protein, they look much larger because of that diffraction limit that I just described. That is, uh, from Ernst Abbe in the late uh, uh, 1800s, this, this equation, lambda over 2NA, it basically says that a point source appears much larger, a few hundred nanometers in the visible, uh, because of the wavelength of light, really. Light is a wave, and so it's the wave nature that makes effectively these spots be big. Uh, and you cannot make this be smaller, okay, uh, by any normal scheme. But by using super resolution, we're going to circumvent the diffraction limit and turn this image into that image. And that's how uh, much more information we're obtaining by these methods. It's a factor, of, uh, it's not a small effect. It's a factor of five beyond this diffraction limit at least in this picture and, and more with some other methods. To be able to surmount the diffraction limit by a, a factor of five or more is, is truly exciting. So let me tell you how it works, and I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to describe it in a, in a general, simple way uh, so that you see the key ideas. There's essentially uh, two uh, key ingredients. First of all, you have to be able to detect a single molecule, but we're not going to count that one. We've been able to detect single molecules for decades now. Here are some images of single molecules at low temperature and at room temperature. Um, now, so the first thing that you want to do is to do something called super localization of the single molecule. Here, here's what I mean. You take those little spots that come from each individual molecule, and you, and you make sure that you blow it up so that the light lands on several pixels of the detector. You want to sample the shape of the spot. In one-dimensional cross-section, you see that the spot has a shape. The shape is coming from the way the microscope works, and we call it the point spread function of the microscope. The image of a point source looks large. It's an airy function. Uh, formally, but uh, the fact that you have different numbers of photons in different pixels is information. You can then use that. It's like measurements. You can use that to fit uh, the shape of the spot using a fitting function. In this case, the Gaussian function works quite well. Uh, <clears throat> now, the Gaussian's width is diffraction limited. Of course, it still has to be. But the position of the Gaussian, the center position of the Gaussian, is another parameter of the fit, and you know that parameter to, to much better, hmm, much better um, precision than the width. The, the error distribution for determining the center is this narrower peak that I'm showing you here, which has a uh, standard deviation sigma. Sigma scales in leading order as the Abe limit, the big number, a few hundred nanometers, divided by now the square root of the number of photons detected. Each photon landing on the camera is like a measurement of the position, and so you're doing n measurements. That's why the precision uh, scales and improves is 1 over the square root of n. <coughs> so <coughs> this, ba whoop. this basically means that if I record 10 to the fourth photons, then uh, my precision could be 2 nanometers for determining the position of the molecule. Now, this idea uh, was not new in science. This idea has been around for, for a very long time. It's been used by astronomers. It's been used even and mentioned uh, by Heisenberg uh, early on, trying to define the position of an electron by scattering photons off the electron. Uh, and biologists have used it many, many times. The, the difference here is that we're using it on a single fluorophore, a one nanometer sized object. Okay, And uh, people like uh, Paul Selvin uh, had, had used this for, for localizing single molecules. <clears throat> so it's a beautiful idea, but here, as I've described it, it only works if the molecules are far apart from one another. And this is not resolution. Resolution is distinguishing two molecules that are really close together. 
And so you need to do something else to, to deal with that situation. And that's where idea number two comes, comes in. I like to call it the active, I like to say that it's active control of the emitting concentration followed by sequential imaging. So what do I mean here? The key element that you need is to have two states of the emitting molecules. The, the mo emitting molecules have one state where even though you're shining light on them, they are off. They don't give you photons. The other state is the on state. When you shine light, then they give you photons. So you, you want to have some, some kind of a mechanism like this that lets the experimenter actively control the fraction of time the molecules are emitting. So let me show you how that can help. Here's the structure that's complex that has many, many labels all along it, because we want to see the shape of that detailed structure. But the molecules are very close together. They're not separated far apart. If I simply let all of them emit at the same time, then these spots from each molecule, I'm going to call it a fuzz ball, these fuzz balls from each molecule overlap. <clears throat> and so that means you don't get any resolution. You can't resolve them when they're too close together. So to solve that problem, you simply don't let them emit uh, all at the same time. You control them so that most of them are in the dark state, and only a few are in a bright state, for example, by photoactivation. So here's the starting situation. If, suppose none of them are emitting. Then if we can turn just a few on, then only a few will be on. And you can find their localizations okay, by this method up here, and then photobleach them. Now you do it again. You turn on a few more. Randomly, others will turn on. And you randomly will sample the underlying structure if you do this again and again. Each time you get a, a list of positions of where the molecules are. You're using the single molecules as point sources, effectively, to determine the underlying, to sample the underlying structure. Then you reconstruct the overall uh, structure just by displaying all of those uh, single molecule positions at the same time. We call it reconstruction. You have to, uh, in the computer, decide how you're going to display all of these positions. And you can obviously see that has much more uh, effective resolution than, than the situation before. So this idea, <clears throat> uh, and I, I first heard about this beautiful idea in April 2006 when Eric Betzig des described uh, this particular part uh, uh, at a meeting at the NIH in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, and he called it PALM, Photoactivated Localization Microscopy. Then soon after that, a storm appeared from the Zhuang lab, F. Palm from the Hess lab, and other schemes, paint, D-Storm, GSM, Blink, Sophie. All of a sudden, a, a menagerie of, of many different acronyms started appearing in the literature, mostly talking about different ways to control the molecules. Uh, at that time, we did uh, a, something called YFP reactivation, okay, based on that YFP optical control I just showed you, yellow fluorescent protein. Uh, but we, we didn't put in an acronym in our paper. <laughs> Not too smart, right? <laughs> you want to have it be remembered, then you should have put in an acronym. So to uh, rectify that situation, uh, let me give, uh, add one acronym to the pile now, um, a mechanism-independent one, Single Molecule Active Control Microscopy, or SMACM. So anyway, that's just for fun. But the, the point is... Uh, this is a beautiful idea, but notice how different it is or how related it is to the low temperature work. In the low temperature work, we could just tune the color of the laser and select out the different molecules at will. At room temperature, we can't do that, so the molecules are being localized at different time points. It's like time domain multiplexing. We're getting the information about their positions at different times. Now, that also means that this scheme may uh, have a certain t it will take time to acquire all these images. And the structure should not change while you're doing all this. Okay, but in spite of that, uh, some people have pushed the speed of this to operate down in, in, in the uh, hundreds of milliseconds time regime, where you get all of these images very, very fast by running a camera very fast. Can I, can I ask a quick question? Sure. To the first part, how do you get the narrow peak? Is there some processing that is needed, or is it? So the way to think about it is, is kind of uh, imagine what I was saying. Right. You have a fitting function, and your fitting function has a width which stays diffraction limited it, it, because physics really hasn't changed here. But the parameter associated with the fit, position, the, the position of this Gaussian, is one of the parameters of the fit. And the, it turns out that the error distribution for determining this, this parameter is much narrower 
okay? Because we add up, in a sense, we use all of the localizations, all of the photons. Each photon landing on the camera is like a, a measurement of the position of the molecule. And so since we're measuring it in times, that means that this, the, the standard deviation of this is going to get smaller by 1 over the square root of n. No, 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 no post-processing at all. It's a single fit. And if you wanted to verify that this is correct, you just measure the same molecule again and again and again, and you will see that the measurements of, of C hat will scatter around a much smaller range. Okay. All right? So uh, there's, uh, this is so, sort of theory showing that this is its leading order dependence, but you could do it also by repeated measurements of the same molecule. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> but let me just say, that, and I'll mention it a little bit more later, uh, this process is one in which I've talked about precision. I've carefully only used the word precision. It, accuracy is also essential, and so as scientists, we have to think about how this process works and make sure it's also accurate as well as being precise. That is, that it's getting the right position, uh, not just a, 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 a measurement that gets better and better as you get more and more photons. Uh, <clears throat> but this other half of this process, this active control scheme, is something that we think a lot about now uh, as chemists and physicists and engineers. Uh, it turns out there are many mechanisms you can use to control molecules now, to make them be on or off. Uh, the basic idea is that we're trying to ultimately create this emissive state, but at low concentration. So we can do that by taking a precursor that's not fluorescent and then using a control beam to create a fluorescent molecule by chemistry, by photochemistry. Uh, and then you can, if you do that weekly, then this will work. Or you can drive molecules into dark states, triplet states, or ionized states uh, using uh, redox chemistry. Uh, the point is, if you, if you have some dark state available, you can control the fraction of time they're in the dark state by the details of these photophysics and by the concentrations that you're using and the intensity you're using. So uh, <clears throat> let me give you uh, some real data now, just so you can see how it works. Uh, here's some bacterial cells. And inside the bacteria, YFP has been fused to a specific protein. Here's one image of the fluorescence from that sample. And then here's the movie of fluorescence from that sample. And you see that it's filled with this fantastic blinking of the yellow fluorescent proteins, OK, that, uh, that are showing you all the different positions that are available for the single molecules. In each frame of this movie, we fit the positions, just as we just talked about, to find where the molecules are, and then uh, list them all at the same time. And so using that scheme, we can turn these diffraction-limited images, OK? This is diffraction-limited, the old way, three different proteins, all of them labeled with YFP. And you notice that the, <coughs> the diffraction-limited image doesn't tell you very much, right? It's just a big blur. But super-resolution on these bacteria shows you so much more. It's really fantastic. This particular one, you know, turns out to have a, a structure that's sort of uh, he helical in some way. This one runs down the center of the cell. It's involved with cell division. And this one that I already showed you is a DNA binding protein. It's a, it, it, it binds nonspecifically to DNA, so it's showing you essentially where all the DNA is inside the cell. Now, just to make sure that it's clear how all this works, okay, I want to give you an analogy. And you can use this to explain the whole idea to your family. All right? Uh, <clears throat> grandmother, mother, father, whatever. Here's the idea. Think about fireflies. Fireflies. Why would you think about fireflies? Well, you think of it the following way. Suppose you have a tree, OK? And the tree has branches. And you want to see the positions of the branches on the tree. And it's nighttime, however. You can't see the tree. So the scheme is you just take fireflies and place them all along the branches of the tree. And you know what fireflies will do? They'll blink on and off, blink on and off uh, at a very low density. Each time you see a firefly, then you quickly record where is it. You know, look on your, on your, on your little cell phone and say, OK, here's where that one molecule was or where that firefly was. And you do that for a whole video of the fireflies blinking. And then uh, just list all the points at the same time, and you'll see the branches of the tree. So I recognize this is not a perfect analogy for the experts. But nevertheless, you know, maybe it'll help you remember. And we can even do it in a cell. Let's do it in a cell. On the left here, I'm showing you uh, one frame of the movie. This is a mammalian cell <clears throat> uh, where we've used uh, one of these dyes, Alexafluor 647, uh, to, and antibodies to label tubulin. So these, are, these spots are coming from where the tubulins are located in the cell. Notice on the right, you see all these little tiny spots. Those, those are the positions of those molecules. 
Uh, the next frame of the movie, uh, different molecules are on because they're blinking very strongly. And do this again and again, and you'll see that over time this spectacular structure appears. Uh, this is essentially the storm-like idea, the, or de-storm-like idea, using uh, for active control in this case. You can see clearly a lot more resolution uh, compared to the diffraction-limited image. So notice that's not too different from this uh, firefly thing I just told you about. Well, what's happened with these ideas? There's been a tremendous amount of work in many laboratories, uh, including here uh, at HKUST, uh, to use super-resolution imaging to learn new things about biology. And there's no way I could summarize all of them. Uh, I just want to point out that it's now being used uh, all over the world. Uh, to just give you one quick example of something exciting that was really uh, discovered uh, by, the, by these methods that wasn't known before. And this is an example from the Zhuang lab. Uh, they were looking at axons, and it turns out that, it, that actin and spectrin form this fascinating periodic pattern. Uh, along the, the long axis uh, of, of the axons, something that was not observed before, but it's basically telling you more about the structure of how these axons are orient, or organized. To give you a different example of uh, another active control mechanism, remember I listed that long thing, and, and I, one of them I said was paint. Well, what is paint? So let me tell you a little bit about paint for a moment, because it's something that Robin Hochstrasser came up with. Uh, the basic idea of paint is to have a structure that you want to observe, but the way you do it is to put fluorophores, the labels, in solution outside the cell. And if they're in solution, they diffuse around very, very fast. So your camera looking at the fluorescence just sees a blur. The photons are spread over many pixels, so you don't see where the molecule is. But once it lands on the surface, once a label lands on the surface and binds to the surface, it sits at one place and gives you all the photons at once. That's the idea of paint. Uh, essentially put molecules in solution, let them move around and diffuse, but when they bind, then they turn on, or at least they give you all the photons in one space, and you can fit that. And, and uh, So we did that, but now here on a neuronal-like cell called a PC12 cell, using a special label, this molecule saxitoxin binds to voltage-gated sodium channels, okay? And uh, my friends in, in the synthetic chemistry, Justin Dubois' lab, can synthesize saxitoxin, that means they can also synthesize it with a fluorophore attached to it uh, by, by, by fairly simple chemistry after you've made the, the, the central structure. And that fluorophore now is, uh, is, is, is bound to the saxitoxin, so it's like a fluorescent ligand that will bind to specific locations, in this case voltage-gated sodium channels. So this is an axonal projection. The main cell is off the screen, and you can see these little spots. The spots are the positions of single molecules that we found during our movie. But we're doing something a little special with this data. We're taking all of the localizations from 500 milliseconds and plugging them all at once, but coloring them differently according to whether they're in the newest frame or the latest frame. In so doing, we can show you some dynamics. I can then show you uh, snapshots just, just like this, but uh, every 500 milliseconds, and then just play them all as one long movie. And that's what this is. This is in, this, these are, so remember, these spots are the localizations of the voltage-gated sodium channels, but essentially with an, uh, uh, an error, uh, sorry, with a time constant of, of uh, 500 milliseconds. And you can see neat things happening. You can see uh, neuritic growths appearing, disappearing. This is a live cell. Uh, and it shows you, we, even though these methods take a little bit of time, that you can still get some dynamics out of these kinds of measurements. Great. <clears throat> so that's the basic idea of super resolution with single molecules, but I've left out a bunch of the amazing fun things that are still going on in this field today. For example, what about 3D imaging? Okay? Uh, I've been showing you two-dimensional images, but you'd like to have 3D images. All right? And so uh, uh, there are a number of schemes that people have used to get th the, uh, the extra dimension, to get Z information. Uh, some of them are called uh, astigmatic imaging or biplane, which is being used by uh, one of the people here. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm going to tell you about some interesting ways to do 3D imaging that involve uh, playing with the microscope itself, learning a little bit more about how the microscope processes the light from a single molecule. So first of all, let's talk about a conventional microscope. Uh, and so here's the key elements of the conventional microscope. Here's a single emitter, and the light from the emitter is collected by an objective lens, goes to the center of the, the middle of the microscope, then a tube lens forms the final image, all right? And so it turns out 
Uh, at this location in the microscope called the pupil plane, the conventional microscope has nothing. It just has an aperture, an aperture, a hole. But uh, we call it a clear pupil. <clears throat> That's what controls what kind of image you get on the camera, uh, especially as you move the molecule as a, up and down in Z. So let's move it up and down in Z. Here we're moving it up and down in Z. And you see that only when it's right at the focal plane do you see a single spot. Otherwise, it's getting large and blurry and out of focus, right? So it turns out this conventional microscope is not very good uh, for three-dimensional localization. It's called the standard point spread function. That's because it changes slowly near the focal plane and is symmetric and blurs and all of that. So to do a much better job in determining x, y, and z, we change the microscope. And the way we're going to do it is to put something interesting in this pupil plane rather than just a hole. We're going to put a phase pattern uh, there, a, a phase pattern. Specifically, uh, we're going to use this pattern first. I'll tell you about some more later. Uh, what this is is a plot of the, the degree to which you delay the light uh, in units of radians, and where 2 pi radians is one wavelength. Okay, So it, think of it just as a, a piece of glass that has different thicknesses. And uh, you know, depending upon the thickness, we can control the phase delay of the light that goes through these different parts of the pupil. And the beautiful thing about this point spread function, or this design of the new point spread function, is that it takes uh, the image of a single molecule and makes two spots on the detector. It's amazing. It's magic, really, right? You know, but it's, of course, also mathematics. It's, this is basically modifying the Gauss-Laguerre functions of the optical field, okay? The functions that control, the, they're basically eigenfunctions of the light field. And we're, we're mixing them up by putting in this phase pattern. And this, was an, I, this particular phase pattern came from work by Raphael Pistun uh, that we've, we've collaborated with on this work. The beautiful thing about this point spread function is that is, if you move the molecule up and down, then you see these two spots revolve around one another. That's interesting. That means that for a, a molecule at a different z position, I have a different angle between these two lobes. So, for example, if, suppose the molecule's there, then I would see this on my camera, and uh, you put a line between these two, these two lobes, uh, and then you, from a calibration, you use that angle of that line to determine the z position, and you, the midpoint between these two is x and y. So you get x and y and z all from, the same, from a two-dimensional camera by encoding the z information in the shape of the point spread function. That's basically how it works. And if you think about this uh, behavior along the z-axis, uh, it's very much like a double helix along the z-axis. But notice it's, it, it, the other beautiful aspect of it, it's in focus over a much larger range. The, the original microscope was only in focus over a few hundred nanometers. This one works over several microns. You can do some amazing things by playing with the back focal plane or the pupil plane. And here's an example of that. You can even make a happy face, believe it or not. You can make a happy face. So here's some single emitters, right? And now I'm the phase pattern is off. Now I turn on the phase pattern, and what do you see? <laughs> you see a happy face. And then you move up and down in Z, it turns into an unhappy face. <laughs> so <laughs> the, there's a lot of fun that you can have by working with uh, the, the uh, Fourier plane. It's also equivalent to the Fourier plane of the microscope. So using that double helix, we now can go back to those bacteria that I talked about earlier and use multiple colors, two different fluorophores, and get the surface in one color and get uh, 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 a, the structure of a particular protein called uh, CREAS uh, with, with the other color. Uh, and it, there's clearly more information in these three-dimensional images. Um, <clears throat> my students uh, have a lot of fun with these point spread functions because they're, they're very creative. Here's one from Matt Liu. It's so-called corkscrew point spread function. It's one half of the double helix, so just a spiral. It has some advantages uh, of different sorts. Uh, <clears throat> here's another one called the bisected mask. Reduces pairs of spots that move apart from one another. And Joachim Schechtman, this postdoc who's been uh, in the lab most recently, has decided to calculate, using optimization theory, what is the optimal point spread function. Now, what would define the optimal point spread function? Mathematically, what we can do in all of these situations is to define something from statistics called the Fisher information, uh, what information is contained in a particular point spread function for determining parameters. Our parameters are x, y, and z. Where's the molecule? 
So you can do a little mathematics, and uh, point spread functions that change quickly give you better estimates of different kinds of parameters. That's the basic idea. And so what he has done is to optimize the Fisher information for a particular range, like three microns, and this point spread function pops out of the computer. We call it, this one, the saddle point. Uh, these are the images of a single emitter at different Zs. And you just, from these shapes, can determine what the Z position is. Uh, going even further, uh, there's a new mask called the tetrapod mask. Here, here's what it looks like in three dimensions. It's, it's very much like a tetrapod, or if you want to think of uh, a, a methane molecule. Uh, <clears throat> there's the phase pattern that produces this. Here's an example of a few of these point spread functions. This one works over a 20 micron range, 20 microns in Z. And, and you can tune it to be different distances, OK, to make it operate over different distances. Uh, so there's a lot of fun in point spread functions. What about this quantification issue? All right, so uh, hang on for just a moment. I want to talk a little bit about these, these business, th this issue of being quantitative and accurate, as well as precise for these localizations. Why is there an issue? Well, it's coming from the fact that a single molecule um, is not a point source of light. If you remember from physical chemistry, what produces light emission and electronic transitions of molecules are dipole moments, or transition dipole moments. This is all coming from the quantum mechanics, but also the way in which light interacts uh, with molecules. So uh, a molecule that's emitting light is, is really emitting that look, something that looks like a donut or a torus that expands to, to uh, large distances. That's what the light looks like coming out of the molecule, coming out of this dipole. And so it turns out, because of that, more light can go through one side of a microscope than the other side, and that would make the spot displaced. That would make the spot on the camera move away from the exact position of where the molecule is supposed to be. Well, this is a problem. This is what we call uh, a systematic error. And uh, so we worried about this in my lab and have come up with three different solutions. One of them is to simply make the emitter floppy. Even though it's attached, it can be on a floppy tether. So if it's flopping around, then its orientation is not fixed, and you average over this effect, and you can quantify that. Or you can measure the orientation of each single molecule. You can measure the orientation of the dipole in, in three-dimensional space, which is a, a polarization spectroscopy experiment. Uh, and if you do that, then you can correct the position of the molecule. And the third solution is a beautiful one that came up from, uh, from my student, Matt Liu. Um, and the idea here is to image only the azimuthally polarized light, the light that is polarized in the azimuthal direction in the back focal plane. You can do that with a special kind of polarization filter. And if you do that, then the shift completely disappears. The, the spot for the single molecule is centrosymmetric about the position of the molecule. So, and we've demonstrated this very recently, the uh, paper that's coming out today, actually. Today is the 16th, uh, in Nature Photonics. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, there are other uh, issues of, of um, uh, quantification uh, that rep basically represent issues about how to calibrate the microscopes, but I'm, I'm going to skip that because of time, because uh, I want to uh, uh, now uh, end this whole presentation with a slightly different set of ideas, just to make sure that everybody's minds are still getting stretched more and more as we go on, right? I've talked about super resolution, which is a scheme for finding the, the shape of a structure, okay, far beyond the diffraction limit. But I want to point out that this whole area of isolated single molecules, the low concentration limit, the one that I showed you at the beginning of the molecules moving on the surface of the cell, is still very powerful because it gives access to dynamics and it allows us to still probe local environments, look at nano antennas, and I'll, I'll even see single molecules in solution. So let me just give you one cell example of what you can do when molecules are far apart from one another and we're interested in just tracking the positions of the single molecules. Uh, an example here is from the primary cilium. On almost all cells in your body, there is a structure called the primary cilium which is about two or to four microns long and maybe 500, 400 nanometers across. It's basically about the size of a bacterium, but it's sticking out from our cells uh, due to some microtubule networks. And it turns out this structure is critical for signaling between cells, crit critical for development, critical for uh, embryogenesis, and for the generation of new kinds of structures, cellular types. That's coming from a variety of signaling molecules. One of them is called the hedgehog signaling molecule. 
hedgehog signaling system. Hedgehog is a small protein uh, that comes, even called sonic hedgehog, that's, that's uh, emitted by one cell and comes over to the primary cilium of this cell. Uh, and it turns out there are proteins called patched in the cell. Uh, sonic binds to patched, and then patched leaves the cell uh, leaves the cilium, but smoothened another protein. I mean, there's all these different proteins, fascinating proteins that are available in biology, but smoothened moves in to the cilium and changes and binds to some other proteins at the tip, which then go into the nucleus at their transcription factors, which changes the program of the cell. So we wanted to explore this process, and so we are in, we're labeling smoothened. We're labeling, fluorescently labeled, smoothened molecules, okay, in the primary cilium. So the, the experiment is a white field microscope experiment. I'm sort of showing you how it works here. Uh, we're looking at cilia that are on the bottom of the cell, uh, right at the interface between the, the cover slip and the cell itself. And here is one of the cilia that, we're, that we can observe uh, when there's a lot of smoothened in the cell. You can see the shape of this cilium here because there's a lot of smoothened out in the cell. As you wait a little bit longer, you, you photobleach some of these molecules, and then you can see singles and watch them moving around in the cilium. So the beauty of this experiment is that the molecules move, and they tell us what they're doing by the way they move. That's the key idea. They move, and mostly you see them diffusing around. So here's the track, the time-colored track of, of single smoothen. It's moving all over the cilium. But notice it moves, but then stops somewhere, and then starts moving again stops another place, starts moving again, stops another place. Here are those different time points where it's stopping. This is one molecule moving for 30 seconds, 30 seconds. And you see all these dynamics and these different dynamical behaviors. In particular, the big surprise was the stopping. That means binding. That means that the smoothen is binding to something that wasn't recognized before. So just by watching the single molecules, we can discover binding sites. And by watching how long they're bound, we get the kinetics of their binding. We get the affinity for their binding to these sites. Uh, in a living cell, okay, just by watching single molecules moving, and it turns out this affinity changes when you provide hedgehog to the system. The affinity changes. It uh, goes down when you, when you turn on the pathway. So that's just an example of, of one of the many experiments being done to watch single molecules and let their motion tell you what's the biology, what's going on. Um, <clears throat> the other example I want to end up with is watching single molecules in solution. And we do that uh, using a device called the anti-Brownian electrokinetic trap that I'm going to describe. But this is basically a way as that lets you study single molecules in solution for a long time. Here's how it works. Suppose that's a molecule, and we want to make it stay where, uh, in one region of space so we can observe it for a long time. But in solution, Brownian motion is strong. The molecule wants to move away. So each time uh, it moves away, we use feedback forces to push it back. So when, when it moves off of the center, then we put some forces on it to push it back. If it, and then if in the next time point, it randomly it may be somewhere else, so we use a different force to put it back. So this, there's basically a closed loop feedback system that's keeping the molecule from running off. And those forces are applied by putting fields on in two dimensions. Uh, we, are, we put fields uh, on the liquid itself. And that causes forces, which are called electrokinetic forces, to move it around. This is all being done in a microfluidic geometry. Okay, So uh, we put electrodes in the solution far away, and that's what's producing the forces on the molecule near the middle. Um, <clears throat> our trap is a 2D trap, although it could be done in 3D, but we're doing it in 2D. And so the Z motion is just being prevented uh, by having the thickness of the trap be only a few hundred, let's say 700 nanometers, in the Z direction. So uh, all of this works because the laser beam is moving around on a pattern in the center. That, uh, that's these little dots that I'm not going to describe in detail now. The laser pattern is critical because that's what determines where the molecules are. Uh, this works because it lets us see single nanoemitters, uh, in particular photosynthetic antenna proteins, chaperonins, redox enzymes, and it even works for a single one nanometer fluorophore. Uh, originally, this was uh, built by Adam Cohen, but all of this new work, uh, especially one nanometer floor force, has been done by Chen Wang uh, here in the lab. Well, you know, what do we do? We, we look at single molecules and we measure their fluorescence and their lifetime, okay? We measure the emitted light and can try to infer what's going on. But in the most recent work, uh, Trent has developed a way to not only measure the emissive properties of the molecule, but also the transport coefficients of the molecule. 
This is really different and very important. So here's a, the trap once again. Uh, what, what he's doing is to take advantage of the fact that we know the positions of the molecules which have been recorded, the molecule, which has been recorded by every photon that's being emitted, and we know the fields that are being applied, the forces that are being applied. And if you use both of those bits of information, then you can analyze the underlying differential equation for the motion of the molecule and reconstruct the trajectory by what's called machine learning or Bayesian inference or uh, expectation maximization uh, learning. Uh, and by having this uh, reconstructed trajectory, then you can produce uh, maximum likelihood estimates of mu and d, of the mobility and the diffusion coefficient of the molecule. Here is that measurement of d and mu for this molecule. This molecule is not doing much. We have d, it's, it's sort of by noise, fluctuating a little bit, and mu uh, as a function of time. When you get those new parameters, d turns out to depend upon, the diffusion coefficient depends upon the radius of the object. And mu depends upon the charge on the object. So we get two new variables that we didn't have before. By, by now plotting mu and d for each single molecule, then uh, here I'm showing you a trimer that has d and mu values that scatter around this part of the, of the parameter space. But if I let it uh, fall apart from trimers into monomers, the monomer peak is somewhere else in this mu d space. In other words, we can distinguish oligomers. We can distinguish the size of oligomers using this kind of, of a machine. We can get distributions of oligomers just by sensing the d and mu of each object that comes into the trap. You can also use this to sense binding interactions. Uh, and we demonstrated that using DNA, a, a single strand of DNA with one fluorophore. That's what's being trapped. Here's the light from that object, which is just fluctuating but not changing. If you add unlabeled complement, unlabeled complement in high concentration, then this will hybridize and melt, hybridize and melt. And so when it hybridizes, it gets larger. So, so the D goes down, but it also inquires charges from the backbone. So the mobility goes up. So D and mu move in an anti-correlated fashion. And here you see the D and mu as a function of time anti-correlated, corresponding to every single binding event, every single hybridization of this single strand of DNA uh, with its partner. So this gives access to the, all the kinetics of the system and so on, and you know, the protein-protein interactions. That's just a very quick flavor of the Abel trap. I'm sorry that's very short, but I wanted to just give you an idea. So, in summary, over these uh, last uh, 10 to 20 to 30 years, single molecules have impacted many fields of science, chemistry, physics, and biology. And uh, all of the beautiful advances that have occurred, of course, have, have come about because many talented scientists, including some here at HKUST, have been using these single molecule ideas, whether it's super resolution or not, uh, and they continue to make and build this, this really exciting field of science. I want to thank my uh, past postdocs and students and collaborators. Uh, here we are at a very serious moment, as you can see. Uh, we thank our collaborators uh, from the agencies that support the work. We have a little logo, the No Ensemble Averaging logo, if you're interested in that. Uh, but notice I say this is the guacamole team. Well, what the heck is that? Remember, of course, one molecule is one guacamole, right? It's one over avocado's number of moles. <laughs> So I apologize for this really terrible uh, pun, uh, but let me just uh, end by once again saying I'm, I'm very pleased to be here, and I want to wish you congratulations and happy anniversary on 25 great years at HKUST. Thank you.